And now on Radio 4, our classic serial, an epic story of love, loss and destiny. Episode 1 of The Aeneid by Virgil Dramatised for radio by Hattie Naylor With Daniel Morden as the storyteller and Richard Harrington as Aeneas Of wars and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate. Yet many blows he took on land and sea from the gods above, thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage. Tell me, Muse, how it all began. Why was Juno outraged? What could wound the Queen of the Gods with all her power? Why did she force a man, so famous for his devotion, to brave such rounds of hardship, to bear such trials? Can such rage inflame the immortals' hearts? You haze at me so. I hate all the Trojan race. I hate them because the king of Troy's son, Paris, judged Venus to be more beautiful than me. Isn't that reason enough? But Venus merely offered him the better bargain, the hand of Helen. The abduction of Helen. The love of Helen. How could a mortal not want Helen? It was the bargain, not Venus's beauty, that won his choice great Juno. And what about my new city? What about Carthage? My beautiful shining city of vine-covered courtyards and white marble temples crafted for the eye, for splendor, for awe, for beauty in my name, in my honor, all to be crushed and wrecked by the vicious descendants of the dispossessed of Troy. Unless... Unless... Unless we can divert, distract this Trojan Aeneas. The son of Venus? Yes, the mortal son of Venus. If we can distract him, then perhaps this new city, this tall, splendid, defiant place that Queen Dido builds, will be left alone. And his people, the people that Aeneas is meant to found in Italy, will not be born. A greater people. Greater books and greater art will flourish in a world that lives under my protection in Carthage. A people that devote themselves to you? Yes, to me. I have 14 beautiful sea nymphs. Dea Pea is the finest. I will give her to you. She will live with you and make you the proud father of handsome children. Unchain your winds. Pound them against the Trojan ships. Sink their warships. Scatter their crews. Blow Aeneas and his men off their course. Swinging his spear, Aeolus strikes at the mountain's hollow flanks. And out charge the winds. Down they crash on the sea. Heaving up huge waves on the Trojan armada. Take down the sails! Quickly! Pitch black night comes brooding down out of nowhere, with thunder crashing pole to pole, and bolts blaze across the heavens. Achates! Ilionius! Tie yourselves on quickly! Come on! Oars shatter, the prow twists round, and a mountain of water towers, massive, steep. Hold fast, or we'll all be lost! And 
and you loved him. Yes, I did. What was his name? Sikaeus. His name was Sikaeus. But he's not with you now. <clears throat> no, Elisa. I hope that my daughter isn't bothering uh, you, my queen. Not at all. <laughs> She suffers from curiosity. That is a good affliction, Cyprian. I have the measurements here. Twenty by one hundred. Is that correct? Yes. And the tower that looks across the harbour, it's even better than your design. Thank you, my queen. Why did your husband not come with you? Elisa! Forgive my daughter. The queen was saying, father, before you came. She was talking about him. I was, Cyprian, I was. Let her ask as she wishes. So you loved him? Yes. I still do. But he was murdered by Pygmalion, my brother. He slaughtered him on our wedding day. And then he hid the crime. Months went past. What an evil man. A greedy man. He wanted Sikaeus' gold. But in a dream, my Sikaeus appeared before me and the truth came out. Sikaeus told me where the treasure my brother ached for was hidden, and I took it. And with Anna, my sister, we gathered ships and sailed here, to Libya, to your people. And is it true, the story of the bull's hide, is that true also? Yes, it is true. Your good king, let Anna and myself stay. And when I asked for land to build upon... He said I could have as much as could be covered by a bull's hide. <laughs> but I broke the hide into thin strips, as thin as silk thread, and made a wide track of my own. <laughs> the good king was true to his words, and this is Carthage, a city to honour my beloved Sikaeus, but most of all for Juno, goddess and protector. And your dear father helps me to build it. I do my best. Come on, Elisa. We have taken up too much of the Queen's time. What God is set to punish us now? Where is my boy? Is he safe? Scanius is bound in his bed below. I've never seen such waves. Look! The cages! Hold on! Before Aeneas' eyes, a toppling summit of water strikes the stern and hurls him overboard, pitching him head first. Aeneas! He's gone overboard! Aeneas! Aeneas! I can't see him! Strewn in the welter now, the weapons, Aeneas! men, Stray spears and treasures saved from Troy. Venus, tears a brim in her sparkling eyes, goes to beg great Jove. But what crime has my son committed? Why would she leave him alone? Her petty vanity knows no end. Juno fears for Carthage. She has been told that if Aeneas lands on Italian shores, a new race will begin, a race that will crush her city, the city that Dido now dedicates to Juno's name. Haven't the Trojans suffered enough? Wasn't the defilement of Troy enough? This dispute is yours. She is my wife. And Aeneas is my son, father. Your grandson. You promised that you would save him. Father. I will ask Neptune to calm the oceans and tell Aeolus to chain his brutish winds. Go before Juno sees. Go before it is too late for your son. Go. As quickly as the tempest came, the waters calm. But men are lost, drowned at sea. Bone weary, the survivors land on Libya's coast and disembark, taking hold of the earth and flinging their brine-racked bodies on the sand. We found them next to the city wall. They say their ship was wrecked. Why are they bound? Release them. <coughs> Give them some water and quickly. 
Thank you. Thank you. Where are you from? From Ilium. We're from Troy, Greek Queen. We are the last of that race. We are God-fearing men. Who have lost all that we love. There is a country called Hesperia, now named Italy after their leader, Italus. This is where the last of our people are bound. You have women with you too? Yes, Great Queen. And a child, the son of our captain who was lost. Our friend. Aeneas. No greater man existed. None more devoted to duty. None more brave in arms. I am sorry for your loss. But come, cast your fears to the wind. Who has not heard of the Trojan people in the city of Troy? I too was an exile, and I welcome you. Perhaps your captain is shipwrecked, lost in woods or on shore. I will send men to scour the coast of Libya far and wide. There is no need, great queen. The waters closed around him. He is drowned. We saw him. He is dead. That's not the best way up the rocks. Which way should I take? You look half drowned. My ship was wrecked. Which way? Here. I will help you. Thank you. Take my hand. Oh. Oh. I am a stranger here. That is very clear. Take this apple. Thank you. Did all your men drown? I don't know. You must be very hungry. Would you tell me where I am? This is a Punic kingdom, the people of Tyre, the border held by Libyans, the Phoenician queen Dido in command. Dido? She flew from her own brother. This I know. You are informed for a sailor. She is good and just, also an exile. She will help you if you ask nicely. That is the way to the city, which she now builds. That path? Yes, the way to Carthage. Goodbye, Aeneas. I didn't tell you my name. Come back! Mother. You wretch! Mother, come back now! Why must you always tease? Why do you ridicule me with your disguises? Reproving her so, he makes his way towards town. Venus screens the traveller with a dense mist, pouring a cloak of clouds around him so no one can see him or ask why he has come. The Trojan ships are brought to shore, moored safely in Carthage harbour, and food is given to the wives and family sheltered in Dido's care. But Achates will not eat and sits alone in the great hall, grieving for his friend. Why do you sit here away from the others, Achates? You must eat. <clears throat> I can't. You must not give in to the sadness the gods send. Your people are survivors of Troy, the only remnant left. You are the last of your kind. You must eat and be strong. I have also lost someone I loved. Sikeos, my husband, he... And at that moment, Aeneas enters, standing clear in the light of day. His head, his shoulders, the man is like a god. His own mother, Venus, had breathed her beauty on her son, a gloss on his flowing hair, and the ruddy glow of youth and radiant joy shone in his eyes. His beauty, fine as a craftsman's hand can add to ivory, or a glow as silver or Parian marble ringed in glinting gold. <laughs> Aeneas! 
<laughs> Katie's my friend. <laughs> Dido watches as the two friends hug and laugh, reunited. And Ascanius is here. Look, your son is safe. My boy. Oh. <laughs> and now Venus is mulling over some new schemes, new intrigues. She makes an appeal to her other winged son, Cupid. We must protect Aeneas, your brother. Change your form. Go in place of the boy Ascanius. Be Aeneas' child this one night and inflame the Phoenician queen. <laughs> Make Dido my ally in love for my son. Cupid leaps at once to his loving mother's orders, and the child Ascanius, Aeneas' his son, is lulled into a deep sleep and swapped and ushered into Venus's shrine. Now Cupid is on the move, settles where Ascanius lay. Aeneas, unsuspecting, takes Cupid's hand and leads him to Dido's feast. The queen is already posed on a golden throne beneath the sumptuous hangings. Aeneas, the good captain, enters, then the Trojan soldiers, taking their seats on couches draped in purple. Queen Dido, tragic Dido, doomed to a plague about to strike, cannot feast her eyes enough, thrilled both by the boy and the gifts Aeneas brings. And the more she looks, the more the fire grows. Then, Cupid makes for the queen. Her gaze, her whole heart, is riveted on him now. For how can she know, poor Dido, what a mighty god is sinking into her? And he... Recalling the wishes of his mother Venus, blots out the memory of Sichaeus in Dido's mind, bit by bit, trying to seize with a fresh living love, a heart at rest for long, long numb to passion. Then the first lull in the feast, the tables cleared away, the queen calls for a heavy golden bowl, and the hall falls hushed as Dido lifts up a prayer. Jove, you, they say, are the god who grants the laws of host and guest. May this day be one of joy for Tyrians here and exiles come from Troy, a day our sons will long remember. Bacchus, giver of bliss, and Juno, generous Juno, bless us now. And come, my people, celebrate with all goodwill this feast that makes us one. With that prayer, she poured a libation to the gods. She was first to take the bowl, brushing it lightly with her lips. Then she gave it to Aeneas, laughing goading him on until he took the plunge, draining the foaming bowl, drenching himself in its brimming, overflowing gold. So Dido, doomed, lengthens out this night of tales, asking Aeneas question upon question, and the wine makes her surer still of Cupid's caresses. Tell me about Troy, Aeneas. I want to hear your story from start to finish. Silence. All fell hushed, their eyes on Aeneas now. You asked me to bring to life how the Greeks uprooted Troy, our kingdom. What horrors we saw. If you long so deeply to know what we witnessed, great queen, then I will try to tell it. For ten long years, we Trojans had fought against the invading Greeks, but the citadel of Troy still held. And then, 
One day, we awoke to find our enemy had vanished. Have you heard the news, Aeneas? Their ships have sailed. That can't be true, Achates. They wouldn't just go. But it is true. The Greeks have given up and left. They're gone. <laughs> but why? Why would they go? They've left something behind on the shore. It, it must be an offering. You must come and see. The men are trying to haul it up the beach. Is that supposed to be a horse? It's in the shape of one. It's very ugly. You'd think an offering, if that's what it is, would be more beautiful. But not so big. What god would want a wooden horse? What is that old fool doing? Stop! Stop! Do not bring it inside the citadel! I fear the Greeks, especially bearing gifts! He's shooting at it, doesn't he know it's solid wood? Well, that certainly hasn't killed it. Look, they've caught someone. Looks like they're taking a prisoner to the king. Come on, Achates. Let's go down and watch the fuss. In the thick of it, a young Greek soldier, hands shackled behind his back, was being brought to King Priam. Trojan shepherds had come upon the man by chance, and he'd given himself up. Help me. Please. Help me. Kneel before the king. Who did this to you? Does it matter? Hush, Berkowal. The man is clearly hurt. Aeneas, give him some of your water. Yes, sir. Here. Thank you. Who did this to you? Ulysses. Ulysses? The man on your own side? He killed my father when I was young. I witnessed the murder. He has watched and terrorized me throughout this war, and now he has taken the sight of an eye and made me lame just before they left. So they have gone? Yes, King Priam. They are gone. But Ulysses knew that I was left behind, and now I come to you begging you for the gift of life. What is left of it? Do not believe him. He is Greek. They know only deceit. What harm can one man do to great Troy, my king? For ten years we have fought you and have not won. What harm can one lame man do when an army cannot defeat you? This wooden horse before me. Tell me of its purpose. The Greeks offended Minerva when they tore down her temple, your temple. Our defeat is due to this offence. The trusted seer Calchas did say he told the Greeks to build a wooden horse to appease her rage. Vast and heavy, so no man can heave it from its place. A horse too large for your city gates. For who possesses the horse will win the war. You say it is made so it cannot be moved? Yes, King Priam. I say the men of Troy can move your wooden horse. No! No! Do not do this! And we will get no. it through our gates. No! And no. worship it as an offering no. to Minerva. No! No! It is a trick, King Priam! Leave it where it stands! No words, no. great king, have I uttered that are untrue. I swear by all the gods, this is their plan. Defeat them, great king. Let me be revenged on Ulysses. Come, let it be done. Open the gates wide. It takes 200 men and a whole day to pull the wooden horse up the beach. When it reaches the gates, it fills the way. Four times it lurches, wedged against the sides. Another 40 men join to pull and we forge ahead, her timbers cracking against the iron of the gates. And only just, only just, is she dragged inside. We haul our demise into our home. That night we feast, celebrate, 
make offerings to the gods, laugh and dance and drink, hang garlands on the neck of the wooden horse. We believe that we are safe. So when Sinon, the treacherous Greek, climbs up to the horse's belly in the early hours of the morning, when it is still dark, when he slips the trap door open, when he releases the Greeks hidden inside, we are asleep and stay sleeping as the first are slaughtered. The first Trojan guard, the first woman, the first infant. I am asleep and dreaming. Escape, son of the goddess. Escape. And in my dream, Hector, long dead, stands in front of me, black with blood and grime, as if Achilles had only just released him from his deadly last journey, dragged round and round the ancient walls of Troy, tears falling down his blistered face. Escape now, Aeneas. Run. The enemy hold our walls. Into your hands I entrust our holy things, our household gods. Seek a city for them. Build new walls to house the gods of Troy. Do not fight. Aeneas, do not fight. The city awakes and begins to reel with cries of grief. I shake off sleep and scramble up to the roof. I hear a roar, like fire assaulting a wheat field, whipped by the south wind's fury, or a mountain torrent in full spate, flattening crops, dragging whole trees headlong in its wake. Out of my wits I seize my arms, fury and rage driving me breakneck on, and I see Pantos. A priest of Apollo's shrine, pulling along his tiny grandson, his hands full of holy things, the images of our conquered gods. The horse stands towering high in the heart of Troy, disgorging its armed men. Our gates are flung open, Aeneas, and Greeks in their thousands flood in. This is our last day. These are Troy's last moments. Spurred on by Pantus' words, into the blaze I dive, wherever the din of combat breaks and war cries fill the sky. Like a wolf pack out for blood on a foggy night, driven blindly on by relentless, rabid hunger, leaving cubs behind, waiting, jaws parched. So through spears, through enemy ranks we plow to certain death, striking into the city's heart, the shielding wings of darkness beating around us. An ancient city falling, a power that ruled for ages, now in ruins. Everywhere lie the motionless bodies of the dead, strewn in her streets, her homes. Everywhere, wrenching grief. Everywhere, terror and a thousand shapes of death. In the heart of the palace, an altar stood. And here, Queen Hecuba and her daughters huddled like doves. And seeing King Priam decked in the arms he'd worn as a young man, she cries out. Are you insane? What are you thinking of? Poor husband, poor husband, put down your sword. There is no defense, no help. Oh, come to me, Priam. This altar will shield us. Or let us die together. And the king moves to join her. But suddenly, a son of Priam, Polites, appears in the doorway. He staggers, reaches his parents, collapses, vomiting out his lifeblood before their eyes. Then his victor, Pyrrhus, Achilles' son, appears. And with all his might, the old man flings his spear. Yeah! But too impotent to pierce, it merely grazes Pyrrhus' brazen shield. And he grabs the old man and drags him away. Let him go! Let him go! Please! And he 
drags the old man straight to the altar, quaking, slithering on through slicks of his son's blood and twisting Priam's hair in his left hand, his right hand sweeping forth his sword, a flash of steel, and he buries it hilt deep in the king's flank. Hecuba and her daughters let out a final scream as Priam is killed. And the women too are dragged away now, for death, enslavement and terrors. Dragged by the hair, raising their burning eyes to the heavens. Helpless. And then I saw her. Helen, hiding in silence. A curse to Troy and her native land. Lurking, skulking, a thing of loathing, cowering at the altar. So she'll be safe and sound once more in Sparta, her native Greece. She'll ride like a queen in triumph with her trophies. I am ablaze with revenge. And I draw my sword to strike her down. When all of a sudden, my loving mother stands before me in all her awesome beauty. My son. Think. It's not beautiful Helen you should hate, or Paris the man you should blame, no. It's the gods alone, the ruthless gods who are tearing down the wealth of Troy. There, there's Juno, cruelest in her fury, sword at her hip, and mustering comrades, shock troops. Run for your life, my son. Put an end to your fighting. I will never leave you. Here, I will place you safe at your father's door. Take all your family. Go quickly, Aeneas. I have kept them safe within, but go now, or even I will be unable to keep you from harm. No, you must come with us. I am too old, Cleosa. I will hold you back. Hush, hush. Please, you must try. No, I am too old to drag this life out in exile. I will die with Troy. Oh, there's no time for this. Pack your things, old man. We must go, now. Your father says he won't come. Tell him. We can't leave without you, father. I'm too old. It is a small price to pay to be buried without rights than to see you captured by my weakness. The delay makes our capture more certain. Father, I cannot, will not leave you any more than you would leave me. I will not be persuaded. Oh. What are you doing? Arming myself further. If my father will not come, then I will stay and fight by his side. But what of us? Your wife and your son? I can't leave him here, Creosa. See what your bullheadedness does. One man cannot defeat the Greeks now. Your stubbornness will mean your son's certain death and no future for your grandson, Ascanius, because you stand here now and argue and make us stay. Troy is finished. We will all die here, all of us, unless you come, unless we leave now. I need a sign. A sign? Not sense. Then let us ask for a sign. If that is what you need, Father, let us appeal to the gods for a sign. Troy is burning. The gods have deserted us. What greater sign is that? Creosa. Not every god. Will she save us? Will your mother save us? Look. She's sending us a message. And a shooting star lights up the sky, leaving a trail of brilliance through the night. We watch it sail over the topmost palace roofs and bury itself at sea. <sighs> Will you come now, Father? Venus, your immortal love, sends you word. Oh, but my legs, Aeneas, my legs. I will carry you. Take a grip of my shoulder. <clears throat> <clears throat> Creosa, give me Ascanius and follow me closely. And so, with my father on my back and my son in my arms, we make our way along the pitch black paths, my wife trailing behind. We near the gates, thinking we are safe. 
and then I catch the steady tramp of marching feet. They're closing in. Run for it, Inez. Run for it. My panic. Something strange, some enemy power robbed me of my senses. Lost, I was leaving behind familiar paths. Creuser! At a run-down blind dead ends, when... Creuser! Oh, dear God. My wife. Creuser! I'd never looked back. She'd never crossed my mind. Creuser! Oh. Outside the gates, we reach the safety of a sacred barrow, and I hide my father and my son, and burnishing my sword, back I go in my tracks, retracing, straining to find my footsteps in the dark. With terror at every turn, the very silence makes me flinch. Then back to our home I go, if only, if only she's gone there. But the Greeks have flooded in, Devouring fire, whipped by the wind, goes churning onto the rooftops, flames surging over them. The Greeks piling high their plunder. Children and trembling mothers rounded up in a long, endless line. Overcome with grief, I dare to shout out. Creusa! But then, as I madly rush from house to house, no end in sight, suddenly, right before my eyes, I see her stricken ghost, my own Creosa's shade. I froze, and my voice choked in my throat. My husband, do not look for me. It is the will of the gods that these things have come to pass. The gods forbid you to take me with you. Exile is your fate. Until you reach Hesperian land, where the Tiber flows through rich and loamy fields. There great joy and a kingdom are yours to claim, and a queen to make your wife. Dispel your tears for Creosa, whom you loved. The great mother of the gods detains me on these shores. And now, farewell. Hold dear the son we share, the little one we love together. And I longed to say so much, but she dissolved into empty air and left me, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. The morning star was mounting above, so I gave way at last, and lifting my father and son, I went back to my people grieving masses from every quarter, ready for me to lead them over the sea. There you have it. Such was the fall of Troy. And your father? He died on the journey. Oh. At the port of Drepanum, peacefully, quietly, with my son and I standing by, the best of fathers, plucked from so many perils, but all for nothing. So Aeneas, with all eyes fixed on him alone, had told his story. A new day's dawn was moving over the earth, and all went quietly to bed. But Queen Dido is consumed by the fire buried deep in her heart and cannot sleep. Dido. Dido, it's me, Anna. Come in, sister. Come in. I heard you crying. Dido, my dear sister, what has happened to you? Have you been hurt? No. No. Has one of the Trojans done this to you? No. Tell me. Aeneas. What has he done to you? Tell me and I'll run him through myself. No, no, he's done nothing. What is it then? What a tale he told. Yes. Such tragedy, but... 
so beautifully told. He is a singular man. Yes. I made a vow. When Zacchaeus was taken from my side. What vow? Never to love again. And this is what makes you cry? How noble his face. How great his courage. The man is born of the gods. I know it. Dear one. Dearer than light to me. Would you waste away grieving your youth alone? The favour of all the gods with Juno's backing drove their ships here. It is blessed. Do you imagine? Such love can be blessed? Yes. And I have seen how he looks upon you. Uh, on me? Yes. You are beautiful. You have the beauty of a hundred Helens. Uh, he looks. Don't doubt it. He looks at me. He does. And imagine the city you will build with this Trojan as your husband and his armies by your side. Just ask the gods pardon. Mm. Treat your guests like kings. Show them your city and delay them with tales of harsh winter storms. That's my advice, dear sister. <gasps> Truly? Truly. And doubt becomes hope and shame dissolves. Dido visits the altars, prays to the gods for blessing. The pick of yearling sheep are slaughtered. A pure white cow, all gravely placed before the gods' fragrant altars. And the victim's chests are splayed. Dido, her lips parted, pours over their entrails, throbbing still for signs. But what good are prayers? to a person mad with love. And in the morning, Aeneas and Dido are split from their hunting party by hail and black driving rain, the vaulting sky shattered by thunder sent by Juno. In here, quickly. Oh, it was a blue sky, not a cloud in view. You were drenched. Take my cloak. You were shaking. Shall I dry you? May I dry you? Dido. Dido. I am fearful to touch you. Do you wish to touch me? We, oui. you are soaked to the skin. Do you? Yes. I do. Then do so. Primordial Earth and Juno, Queen of Marriage, give the signal. Let the lightning torches flare and the high sky bear witness to their wedding. Nymphs on the mountaintops wail out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death. The first of grief, the cause of it all. From now on, Dido cares no more for appearances, nor for her reputation. She no longer thinks to keep the affair secret. No, she calls it a marriage, using the word to cloak her sense of guilt. Straightway, rumor flies through Libya's great cities, a monster, horrific, huge, and under every feather of her body, what a marvel, eyes that never sleep, and as many tongues as eyes. Then swerves her course straight to Olympus, and Jove himself with her many tongues, a gorgon goddess spewing her bile in Olympus's court. <laughs> it's obscene, lewd, explicit. Day in, day out it goes. In and out and out and in. Merry making, fornicating. Why are you here? It never stops. I didn't call for you. Don't you know? Have 
haven't you heard? So total then. Love. Their lust. She says they're married. Does she just? <laughs> so nothing is built. Everything is neglected. Her city. Need explicit. Gross. What? What are you talking about? Aeneas and Dido. You're the last to know. They're the last to hear. Why, the whole of Africa knows. And what of his lineage? What of his reign? Weren't you sending him elsewhere? All for Italy's gain? In and out. Out? Get out! Say, thought you should know. Thought you'd want to hear it. Thought it best to tell. Love. <laughs> Get out! Get out now! Only saying we wanted to help. And Jove calls Mercury to his side and whispers in his son's ear. Mercury flies between earth and sky to the sandy coasts of Libya, cutting through the winds to land brilliant and blistering in all his god's finery, stands in all his splendor in Aeneas's way. Why do you remain here, Aeneas, wasting time in Libya? Does not your glorious destiny fire your spirit? No. Then think perhaps of your son, Ascanius, you owe him Italy's realm, Aeneas, the land of Rome. Do not defy the king of the gods. Do not waste time by cheating Jove still further, or the line of your fate so carefully drawn. This is not your future. Know it. All at once, Aeneas knows. He cannot stay in Carthage. He cannot ignore his destiny. He must go. He summons his men, orders them to fit out the ships, thinking to steal away in the night, not knowing how to tell her. But rumor visits Dido's door, hissing, cursing, bullying the unbelieving queen. Go and look for yourself. Dido, frantic, Non-believing, searches in their shared places, their secret haunts, and then, in fear, down to the coast, where his ships lie. But my love, what are you thinking? Dido, forgive me. I have no choice. Would you steal away without a word? Where is the bravery in that? You're running away from me? The gods, Dido, the gods. The gods? But what do I have left when you are gone? Reject the scheme of yours. Dido. Reject it. I cannot. Why? Oh. Oh. I honor our marriage vows. Oh, but unwed. Oh, Aeneas. You truly intend to go? Dido, please. Then I am undone. You have ruined me. You have shown me much kindness. Kindness? I shall never deny what you deserve. Never regret my memories of Dido. Memories? If I was free to live my life, then I would stay. You are free. No, I am not. The dead, Dido, all the dead of Troy line up behind me. Their loss cannot be in vain. Their suffering cannot mean so little. In Asperia, I can begin again. For my dead father's anxious ghost, for all the Trojan dead, and for my living son. What of me? What of love? You were not there. You did not see the end of Troy. There are things more important than love. No! That is all we are! I cannot stay. I have been so foolish, so blind. What was I thinking? Now it is too late, don't you see? Too late. You have robbed me of everything. No goddess was your mother. You traitor liar, no. The Caucasus fathered you on its flinty rock. And the tigers of Hikania gave you their dogs to suck. It was 
washed up on my shore, helpless. I took him in, plucked his crews from death, let him share my kingdom. <gasps> what work for the gods on high. There's no faith left on earth. Harry with hatred on all your line, your race to come. There will be no love between our peoples ever, no pact of peace. Sea against sea, sword against sword, this my curse. War between our peoples, all their children, endless war. I won't hold you. Go. And she turns away, sweeping out of sight and leaves him numb with doubt and all he had not said that he had not told her of his love for her he did not describe the tear in his gut the rupture in the chambers of his heart that even as he told the story of the fall of Troy even as he listed the crimes and cruel wrongs she could never know the guilt of surviving a guilt that all the love in the world cannot mend. What are you doing? Gathering all of Aeneas' possessions. You couldn't persuade him? No. A priestess is coming. She says I need to gather all his things, his clothes, his weapons and our bed, and make a grand pyre, and there place all that is his, and something precious of mine. And then, then the fates can be turned back. The gods can change their minds. Yes. Help me, sister. Help me build this grand and beautiful pyre, for all the city must see it and know it. And towering with pitch pine and cut logs of oak, throughout the day and into night, they build the pyre. Aeneas is sleeping on his ship. He awakes to find Mercury at his side. Why are you still here? Can't you see the danger you are in? Set sail. Leave at once. That woman seeks revenge. Away, Aeneas. Away. And he, stumbling, frightened, runs on deck. Spread the canvas! Hoist and haul! As dawn rises from her saffron bed, Aeneas hacks the mooring lines with naked blade. Dido mounts the pyre. She looks out across the water, sees them go. She takes Aeneas' sword and plunges the blade so deep she foams with blood, her hands splattered her body falling onto the pyre. The city wails in grief. Anna runs through the crowd, stunned, breathless, in terror. Dido! Did you spare no thought for me? Sister! Friend! All that I loved! She climbs the pyre's topmost steps, and now, clasping her dying sister to her breast, she sobs. Dido tries to raise her heavy eyes once more, fails. Deep in her heart, the wound keeps rasping, hissing on. Three times, she tries to struggle up onto an elbow. Three times, she falls back, writhing on her bed. Juno, in all her power, filled with pity for Dido's agonizing death, speeds to release her spirit, wrestling now in deathlock with her limbs. And since she was dying a death not fated or deserved, she cut a lock of hair for Proserpina's glade. And at once, Dido's life dissolves 
into the winds. In episode one, Aeneas was played by Richard Harrington, Anchises by Robert Pugh, Creusa by Sarah McGaughy, Achates by Matthew Gravel, Cyprian by Ben Crow, Queen Hecuba by Airy Thomas, Jove by Michael Burtonshaw, Juno by Rachel Atkins, Venus by Annette Badland, Dido by Daphne Alexander, Anna by Amita Diri, and Elisa by Aisha Antoine. The storyteller was Daniel Morden. The music was composed by Will Gregory, arranged by Ian Gardner, and performed by the BBC Singers, conducted by Matthew Hamilton, with soloist Cherith Milburn Fryer. Percussion was by Joby Burgess. Virgil's Aeneid was adapted by Hattie Naylor from the translation by Robert Fagels, and was a BBC Cymru Wales production, produced and directed by Kate McCall. Episode 2 of The Aeneid by Virgil Dramatised for radio by Hattie Naylor With Richard Harrington as Aeneas Fiona Shaw as the Sybil and Daniel Morden as the storyteller Dido, great queen of Carthage, is dead. Her life taken by her own hand with the sword of her lover, Aeneas. Trojan Aeneas, who is sailing away, oblivious to her death for the loss of him. He is sailing away to Hesperia, instructed by Jove himself to found a new realm, a new race. For nine days he holds the Trojan fleet on course, ploughing the waves blown dark by the north wind. Then the wind shifts and comes roaring out of the west. Skimming over the white caps, they head into port on Sicilian soil. Acestes, born of a Trojan mother and the sea god Crinesus, is watching from the fields and is amazed to see his own kin. Yes. <laughs> it is you, isn't it? No, oh, you don't recognize me. Uh, I'm not certain. Well, you were only a lad when we last met. You are so like your father. You knew my father? Well, certainly I knew him. I'm from Troy. Uh, are you a Kestis? <laughs> yes. It's not so different after all. <laughs> yes. You said, um, knew my father. Is he, uh, not with you? He died after we left Troy. Peacefully, quietly, with both myself and his grandson, my boy, Ascanius, by his side. It's a year since we committed his bones to earth. Oh, my dear friend. Hmm. So much hardship to lose your old man and your father. Such loss. Such terrible loss. Anchises, father of Aeneas, Venus's lover, marked by time. Anchises, who wanders next to the river, in the house of the dead. Let us hold funeral games, to remember you a good and noble father. We'll have archery, wrestling, swordsmanship, racing. That even as they plan their games, targets laid and sandpits dug, the Trojan women are complaining. This isn't as be 
here? Uh, no. Well, why are we stopping here? For games. They want games. Games? Funeral games for the father of the captain. He shattered a queen's heart. And now we delay for games. Yes. He doesn't even think of her. Are we even near Esperia? Mm. I don't know. Oh, I'm so tired of the sea. Of sailing. Mm. The funeral games begin. Javelins are thrown. Arrows drawn. Targets shot. Wine drunk. Anchises is honoured and remembered with revelry. Do you have a complaint? Yes. We cannot contemplate another journey. My father is frail and old. My mother is sick. These are all the people I have. It is the fates that drive me on. Can I not ask? So we are certain of their direction. We are so very tired, Aeneas. My father can't travel anymore, Captain. Please don't ask this of us. Let the old and weak of us stay here. But the Kestis is our guardian. We are told there's more fighting to come. More death ahead. What use will we be to you then? I can't live through such hardship again. I can't live through another tree. <laughs> Watching the women cry for their homeland and ache for safety, Aeneas wrestles the anguish in his heart. Should he forget his fate and settle in Sicily or head for Italian shores? At night, as he lies restless in sleep's cradle, his father's ghost walks into his dreaming. My son, Dearer to me than life, my dear son, so pressed by the fate of Troy. Let the old, frail and unwilling stay here on Sicilian shores. Choose your elite troops, your bravest hearts, and sail them on to Italy. Land at Cumae, and there go to the Sibyl's cave. Let her lead you into the depths of the underworld. Go down to the house of death and meet me there. Learn what is to come. What you will begin on Italian soil. And the city that will make you her own. But now, farewell. Cruel dawn breaks in the east. One last thing. Easy it is to descend but hard to return. Take with you the golden bough hidden in Kumai's glade. This gift for Proserpina ensures your safe return. With that, he vanishes into thin air, a wisp of smoke. So it is agreed. Those that elect to stay disembark all those who feel no need for glory. No more wavering now, buoyant spirits seize Aeneas's heart. All on board! Step the masts! Man the sails! Yes, Captain! And as one, they make the sheets fast and let out canvas, bellying now to port, now to starboard. Westward! Take us! Westward! Cumai, the sailors leap to land. Strike seeds of fire buried in veins of flint. Find water, hunt and eat and rest. But devout Aeneas searches only for the golden bough, begs for signs, prays for help. When two white doves play above his head, they lead, he follows. And there in the deep dank wood, the golden tree, the bough he plucks. And now he makes his way to the Sibyl's secret haunt. 
carved out of the rocky flanks of Cumai, lies a vast cave, deep in the gaping jagged rock, a cave pierced by a hundred tunnels. At the entrance of the cave, Aeneas waits. The Sibyl calls from within. No! It's the time to ask your fate to speak. The Sibyl emerges. All of a sudden, all her features, her color changes. Her braided hair flies loose. Her heart bursts with frenzy. She seems to rise in height. The ring of her voice, no longer human, the breath. The power of the god comes closer. Closer. Why so slow, Aeneas? So slow to pray, to swear your vows, to offer your oxen, to light the fire. Not until you do will the jaws of our spellbound house gape wide. An icy shiver runs through the Trojan's spine. He kneels, prays, lights the fire, hurries to carry out the Sibyl's orders. The Sibyl draws closer. Steadies four black-backed calves, tips wine on their brows, plucks tufts from the crown between their horns, and casts them over the altar fire. First offerings, crying out to Hecate, Queen of Heaven and Hell. She runs knives under throats, catches warm blood in bowls. Aeneas himself. Sword drawn, slaughters a black fleeced lamb to the Fury's mother, Night, and to her great sister, Earth, and to you, Proserpina, kills a barren heifer. Then, to the king of the river Styx, he raises altars into the dark night, and over their fires lays whole carcasses of bulls and pours fat oil over their entrails. They say that the gates of the underworld are here. Teach me the way. Allow me to go and see my beloved father. Let me meet him face to face. The earth groans, and the wooden heights quake, and across the gloom, the hounds howl. As the goddess comes closer, wars, horrendous wars, and the Tiber foaming with tides of blood. I see it all. Tear your sword from its sheath, Aeneas. Now is the time for courage. Now for the steady heart. And into the yawning cave she flings herself, possessed. And Aeneas follows. You gods, who govern the realm of ghosts, you voiceless shades and chaos, you, the river of fire, you far-flung regions hushed in the night, lend me the right to tell what I have heard. Lend your power to reveal the world immersed in the misty depths of the earth. On they go, dim travellers under the lonely night. On through the gloom, the empty halls of death's ghostly realm. And there, in the entryway, the gorge of hell itself, where grief and the pangs of conscience make their beds, and fatal, pale disease lives, and bleak old age, dread, and hunger. Seductress to crime, and grinding poverty, and deadly struggle, and death, and twisted, wicked joys, and facing them at the threshold, war, rife with death, and the Furies' iron chambers, and mad, raging strife. Whose blood-stained headbands knot her snaky locks. There, in the midst, 
A giant shadowy elm tree spreads her ancient branching arms. Home, they say, to swarms of false dreams, one clinging tight under each leaf. And a throng of monsters, too. What brutal fools. Centaurs. Hybrid sinners, part women, part beasts. And the savage-headed Hydra, hissing horror. Gorgons, harpies, and triple-bodied Geryon. Aeneas grips his sword in terror. Don't look them in the eye, Aeneas. Look away. Walk quickly past. They are flimsy will-o'-the-wisps, phantoms, and thin air. This way, I can hear the whirlpools roar. And here, in the Wailing River, Charon, the ferryman, eyes in fixed fiery stare, and grimy rags hanging down, punts his red skiff, carrying souls across Acheron. A huge throng of the dead comes streaming towards the bank as he nears. They are the helpless, the unburied. The ferryman cannot take them across. No spirits can cross the roaring river until their bones are buried and they rest in peace. And us? Will he let us cross? I will deal with the ferryman, Aeneas. Not one more step, whoever you are. This is the world of shadows. The realm of night. <coughs> I, I can tell you, I have little truck with heroes, if that's what you are. When Hercules came, I sailed him over, and he stole our watchdog. Others tried to snatch our queen, Proserpina, from her bed. <coughs> what do you want here? There is no treachery, ferryman, not here with this Trojan son. Be calm. Your dog is safe, as is your queen. Aeneas, a remnant from Troy, goes down to deepest hell to speak with his father's shade. What's that to me? <coughs> Give me the bow, Aeneas. This, this is what it is to you. She holds up Proserpina's gift, the golden bow. At this, Charon stills his boat. The heaving rage subsides in his chest as he marvels at the fateful branch unseen so many years, luminous gold in the colorless place. He clears the boat makes way for Aeneas and the Sibyl, takes them swiftly from shore to shore over the thick black water, delivering them to triple-headed Cerberus's watch. Is that your trembling beast, ferryman? Uh, here's a honey sop for his temper. A sop soaked in drugged seed. The dog Three jaws spread wide, snatches, eats, sprawls, snorts, and soon sleeps. Aeneas seizes the way in. At that moment, they hear them. Ghosts of infants, weeping, robbed of their share of sweet life, all snatched from the breast, swept off and drowned in bitter death. And close to the spot, extending to the horizon, the fields of mourning. So many souls. Who are they? They died of love. The harsh, wasting sickness of cruel love. And those in the grisly swamp there. They brought death by their own hands. Its loveless, lethal waters bind them fast. And there, wandering amongst them, her wound still fresh. Dido? Oh, oh dear God. Was it I that did this? Dido? Dido, come closer. Stay a while. 
please speak to me. Don't go. Dido, I, I beg you. I, I, I beg you, dear love. D Dido! Dido! But Dido, eyes fixed to the ground, turns away fleeing back to the shadowed forests where Sicaeus, her true husband, answers her anguish, meets her love with love. Night comes on, Aeneas. We waste our time with tears. They go on. Towards the wall of fire, Tartarus itself, a blazing flood of lava and whirling boulders thundering around a fortress. And from within, the groans and cries of the terrified, desperate, condemned. Do not pity these souls, Aeneas. Here. Cretan Radamanthus rules with an iron hand, censuring men, exposing fraud, forcing confessions when anyone up above, reveling in his crimes, puts off his day of atonement till he dies. The fool, <laughs> too late. That very moment, Aeneas, on that hour, vengeful Tisiphone, armed with lashes, springs on the guilty, whips them till they quail, summoning up her savage sisters, the bands of furies. And there, through the gates, can you see the sentry crouched at the threshold? Fiercer still, the monstrous Hydra, fifty black mouths gaping. And beyond, the abyss, Tartarus itself plunging headlong down through infinite darkness. Here some tortured souls push giant boulders. Others dangle, racked at breaking point on spokes of rolling wheels. Here Flagius in agony shouts out his warning. Never scorn the gods! Ah! Bow to justice! You are forewarned! Ah! And here, those who hated their brothers while alive or struck their fathers down, or killed for adultery, or bartered their native land for jewels and saddled her with a tyrant, and set up laws for another bribe. Help me. Help me, please. I meant no wrong. This one forced himself on his daughter's bed. I meant no wrong. Sealed an unholy marriage. Please. All dead and did outrageous crimes. But come, press on. See it through. Do not let their agonies divert you. Be strong, Aeneas, certain of your good. Complete this duty. She leads him to a silver-lit gate along a shadowed path. Aeneas springs to the entryway, and here, in the goddess's grove, takes Proserpina's golden bow, places it in the goddess's hand, then bows and kneels at her feet. Aeneas, Trojan captain, here is the way to Elysium, the land of joy, where the blessed make their homes. Here, a dazzling radiance clothes the fields, and the spirits possess their own sun, their own stars. Here, mourned in the world above, and fallen dead in battle, are the sons of Dardanus. There, devout Aeneas. There, go through. Aeneas, Aeneas, come to me, Aeneas. Do you not see your father? Aeneas! He is calling to you. Aeneas runs across sweeping fields, through the soft grass and gentle breeze, arms outstretched towards his father. Let me embrace you. Don't recoil from me. You cannot hold me, Aeneas. Stand away. You cannot feel your arms about me. I am thin air, a whisper of the self. Your ghost, your grieving ghost, so often it came to me. 
Let me hold you, father. So Aeneas pleaded, his face streaming with tears. Three times he tried to fling his arms around his father's neck. Three times he embraced nothing. The phantom sifting through his fingers, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. I am a mere shadow, my son. Father. A specter of what Anchises once was. You cannot hold me now. But I can tell you, talk to you, show you all of what is to come. All of what is to be, or will be, can be, by your willing deed. Anchises guides his son into the valley's green depths, to a sheltered grove and rustling wooded breaks, the river Lethe flowing past the homes of peace. Around it hovered numberless races, nations of souls, like bees in meadowlands on a cloudless summer day that settle in flowers, riots of colour, swarming around the lily's lustrous sheen, and the whole field comes alive with a humming murmur. Who are those armies of souls gathered at the water's edge? They are the spirits owed a second body by the fates. They drink deep of Lethe's currents, long draughts that will set them free of cares. And this is what they wait for? This is where life begins? The seeds of life are in the sky and the earth, the flowing fields of the sea, and the shining orb of the moon. An inner spirit feeds them, coursing through their limbs. Mind stirs the mass, and their fusion brings the world into birth. That is where life resides, Aeneas. But as we live, we are weighed down by the body's ills, or dulled by earthly limbs and flesh that's born for death. That is the source of all men's fears and longings, his joys and his sorrows. Nor can they see the heaven's light, shut up in the body's tomb, a prison dark and deep. And why is there such agony, father, in this dreadful place? Because we waste away our lives on cunning and deceit, always forgetting heaven's light. We must pay for all offenses, Aeneas. The suffering you have witnessed is the purge, the rent on living. Some are hung, splayed out. Some plunged in rushing floods, their stains, their crimes scoured off or scorched away by fire. Then, when all their spirits are cleansed, they are sent to Elysium's broad expanse, where we stand now, in open fields of joy. God calls them forth to the river Lethe, which is where they wait, those great armies of souls their memories blank so that they may revisit the world and begin once more Anchises silent for a moment drawing his son and the Sibyl with him into the midst of the murmuring throng took his stand on a rise of ground where he could scan the long column marching towards him come sons of Troy Walk through time, bright souls, future heirs of our name, of our renown. You see that youth in his, leaning on the tipless spear. He is your son to be, your last born, a king who fathers kings. And there in his, a son of Mars through our lineage born, Romulus. Founder of Rome, this brilliant Rome whose empire marches across the world, blessed in her breed of men. And here is Caesar and all the line of your firstborn, Ascanius, our blood. Caesar Augustus, son of God, who returns to us a golden age, a second 
Troy. Anchises leads his son through each new scene and fires his soul with a love of glory still to come, the future visited in the half-light. Here, at journey's end, Anchises guides his son and the Sibyl towards twin gates. One made of horn, which offers easy passage, and one of ivory, radiant and flawless, where the dead send false dreams up towards the sky. They say a gentle, tender goodbye. They will be together again. Then, Aeneas and the Sibyl walk through the ivory gate and into the light. Awaking on the Cumaean shore, Aeneas wastes no time. He prepares, he makes ready, he calls to his men, all is to be gained. He sets sail for Latium. Oh. oh, keep still. What is it out? Have you got it all? What are you doing? Oh, I don't know. What will Turner say? Oh, is it very bad? Oh, it's only saying... Now, keep still. Were you standing too close to the candles? No. Oh, your beautiful hair. What has she done? She's burnt her hair. How did she do that? She was by the altar offering prayers too near to the candles. I, I was standing away from the flame, Father. I was. And who were you offering to? To Electo. So the furies, why? I, d I don't know why. She came to me. I thought of her. I don't know why. And well, suddenly my hair was alight. Well, offering to Venus would have been safer. I was saying, I don't know what Turnus will say to having a betrothed with burnt hair. I must ask Faunus. Faunus? Why? Such things have meaning, Amata. Such things tell us, warn us, of the path ahead. It's an accident, I think, Latinus. Nothing more. Not if she was standing away. I was standing away, Mother. Bring him. Oh, this is fuss, Latinus. Bring him. Now. And Faunus, the great seer, is called and sits at the feet of Latinus, king of Latium, and Queen Amata, his wife. He offers prayers and listens to their daughter, Lavinia, studies her black and singed hair. And in a seer's trance, he tells them, Never marry Lavinia to a Latin. But she's already betrothed. Oh, she matter. Put no trust in marriage ready-made. But she's promised to turn us. Be quiet. Strangers will come. And their lifeblood will lift our name to the stars. No. No! She's to marry Turnus. You cannot listen, Latinus. You cannot let this be, please! Let me think. I thought it was agreed, Father. Father! News of a foreign army landing on their shores reaches Latinus's court. Are these the men foretold by fate? But merciless Juno, winging back from afar, holding course through their heavens, sees the boats upon the shore. Why couldn't they die on the plains of Troy? Why couldn't they stay defeated in their defeat? Why couldn't the fires of Troy cremate the Trojans? No. Through the shocks of war, through walls of fire, Aeneas still thrives. That said, the vengeful goddess swoops down to earth and stirs Alecto, mother of all sorrows, from her den, where nightmare furies lurk in hellish darkness. Come, monster, shift your forms, your shape so fierce. Don't let my honor, my fame, be torn from its high place, or the Trojans bring Latinus round with lures of marriage. Electo, queen of all the Furies, who can make brothers bound by love gear up to mutual slaughter, demolish a house with hatred. Do me this service, virgin daughter of the night. 
bloated with gorgon venom. Alecto launches out, first to Latium and Amata's side. She flings a snake from her long black hair, thrusts it down her breast and into the very heart of the queen. The viper glides between her robes, her smooth breasts, breathes a martyr into a frenzy, its clammy poison stealing into her very blood. I will not allow it! And she the runs child, screaming, threatening the her husband. Turnus! Listen to my words! She has promised to Turnus! She's already promised to her kinsman I will not allow it, Latinus! Latinus! And that complete. Alecto shapeshifts into Calibi, Turnus's ancient seer, goes to Turnus, Lavinia's betrothed. Turnus, do you not know? Have you not heard? Lavinia's hand is offered elsewhere to the Trojan captain Aeneas. Does no one say? Did no one tell? And proud Turnus roars, blazing, frenzied. He shouts for armor, cries for war. A river boils inside him, bubbling up a spume. Listen! The Trojans plan to take my queen, our land, this treasured place of ours. Get ready for war! Hurl the enemy from our borders! He fills his Rutulian troops with headlong daring and hoists a banner of war. Piercing trumpets fill the realm, all of Latium stirred in frenzy, Alecto's work complete. And what of Aeneas? He's exploring this new horizon, up some unknown river that flows into the sea with a small band of followers. The trumpets do not reach him. Aeneas, Aeneas, quickly. And he, startled, sees his mother standing on the deck, iridescent, vivid, Venus in all her grandeur. King Turnus of Rutulian blood prepares to fight wars against your race. My son, find allies. Quickly, follow the river. Take your boat, sail its course. Go to the court of Evander, ask for his aid. They wage an endless war against the Latin people. Seek them as allies. Seal that pact. Follow the river, Aeneas. Follow the Tiber's flow. Aeneas follows the Tiber as Venus commanded, nearing a fortress, a humble kingdom, a city small. A youth stands before them across the water. Soldiers, who are you? Do you bring peace or war? We're Trojan born. Put down your spear. We are exiles driven here by Latin's our mutual foe. We look for King Evander. What do you want of him? Tell him this. Leading chiefs of Dardania come, survivors of Troy, pressing to be his friends in arms. Come on to dry land, famous sons of Dardanus, and speak to my father, King Evander. Aeneas's fame goes before him, no sooner knelt before King Evander than held and hugged and kissed. You're most welcome, Captain Aeneas, a guest of our house. We're long-held friends, both Trojan and Arcadian brothers. Turnus we have feared for many years, a hothead, belligerent and insolent, well known for his attempts on our territory. And if you say a war is coming, then we will gladly join you in battle to bring the Latins down at last. But first, we must sit and praise and honor so that our fight is blessed. The guests are seated and fed. Offerings are made to the immortal gods. Gifts from Ceres, wheated loaves just baked. And in Bacchus's name, 
They keep the wine cups flowing. Feast on long-backed oxen. Please, father! No harm will come to me. No, Pallas. I beg you. You are too young to go, too young to fight. My son begs to go with you, Aeneas. Let this be my first war, a war against Turnus and the Latins. Father, he taunted us for so long. Let it be this battle. Can you guard him, Aeneas? Return him to my side. There is no true safety in battle. It is a place where chaos and anarchy rule. See, Pallas, listen to this wise man's words. Father, how can I serve you well? Lead your kingdom if I have not protected her, fought for her. I am of age. Let me be worthy of your name, of the name of king. Very well. If you must, do me proud. <laughs> I will, father. I will. Aeneas, guard him. Guard my son. It is agreed. Evander lends Aeneas his treasured son. But there, on the headland, Turnus is galloping wildly back and forth looking for a way to attack. He scans the Trojan camp and the Armada riding at anchor. He flares in anger, resentment searing him to the bone. Bring up fire! Burn the fleet! Burn them! Whole battalions equip themselves with blazing torches. A swirl of sparks and ash. The ships! Our ships are on fire! Run! Fetch water! Anything! Save our fleet! Rhea, mother of all gods, mother to Jove himself, comes crying to Jove's door. I had a grove on a mountain crest. A pine wood, dark with pitch pine, shady with maple timber. These woods I gladly gave to the Trojans to make their fleet. But now, my son, ruler of Olympus, these galleys are burning. What would you have me do, mother? What privilege do you beg for your ships? Should Aeneas go through scathing dangers unscathed? I only ask for the grove so dear, the pitched pine and maple, so sacred. I cannot return the fleet, but their mortal shape I will unhinge. First, a radiant flash, then a cloud, Suddenly, all the vessels, snapping their cables free of the bank, dive like dolphins, plunging headlong beaks into the bottom's depths, then up they surface. Each a sea nymph swimming out to sea, the Rutulians shrink in panic. Undaunted, Turnus flares up once more. Don't you see this good omen? Jove himself has whisked away the Trojan fleet. They have no ships. This Trojan race will end. Let us prepare for Aeneas's return. Aeneas, with Pallas at his side, rests on Tiber's bank, deep in slumber. Aeneas, son of Venus, awake. Aeneas! Aeneas! Startled, Aeneas stirs, and from the river, the sea nymph Simodice calls. Here I am. 
in the Tiber's flow, I was your ship, made from sacred pine, one of your fleet, Aeneas. Traitorous Turnus burnt us, and our great mother, Rhea, changed our shape. Turnus surrounds your camp. Turnus set on seizing all. Your men need you. Return to leave them now. And she closes with a dive, plunging back into the river. Come, Pallas. It's time to fight. Aeneas takes a sheaf of weapons. He won't miss a single man. He seizes a heavy lance and swings through a Rutulian. All run to hold and harm their enemy. But who can halt Aeneas? Not a chance of that. Some are choked by burly spear, some cut down, some sliced and wounded. All sides suffer in the bloody chaos. War's black mouth blood-filled, frenzied, hate. Comrades fall as friends cry death, brothers die. And Pallas dives and lunges, killing quickly, defiantly, drumming the fields of Italy with his heels. Turnus sees him, knows him well, Evander's son and heir. He shouts to his men. I'll go after Pallas! Pallas is my prize alone! At this, his comrades clear the field, and Pallas, his manly growth so new, struck dumb, runs his eyes over Turnus's vast frame. Now's my time to win some glory, for stripping off a wealth of spoils, or dying a noble death. Know this, Turnus, my father can stand either fate. Pallas marches out to open field. Down from his chariot, Turnus vaults. Pallas throws his spear, full force. It flies through the air and hits the armor high up, where the bronze rims the shoulder's edge but it only scrapes the skin of Turnus's massive body and glances off. Turnus balances his long oakwood spear with its iron tip and cries, Now we'll see if my spear pierces deeper! Turnus's spear goes shattering through iron, bronze, layers of oxhide with stabbing impact, piercing breastplate's guard and palace's chest, Pallas wrenches the spearhead, warm from his wound. No use. His blood and his life breath follow hard on the same track out. Turnus trumpets over him. Take a message home to Evander. Tell him this. The palace I send him back will serve him right for making pacts with Trojans. And with that, he stamps his left foot on the corpse and strips away Pallas's sword belt. Pallas's own, his father's father's, proudly worn heritage. And now, Turnus's own. Such a heavy blow. News of tragic death reaches Aeneas on rumor's wings. Aeneas, noble captain, elsewhere on the battlefield, blazing with rage, he searches out proud Turnus for bloody revenge. And so once more it begins. The ranks storm forward, and deaths of fathers, sons, brothers, lovers. With a blow to the head, a plunge into a throbbing heart, all hell breaks loose. All on attack. No rest, no let up, total war. The Trojans break through, march on Latinus's walls. Queen Amata looks out from her fortress and sees the Trojans approaching, and not a Rutulian in sight. Was it me? 
Was it me that started this war? It's turn us dead. Is that why no one is here to defend us? Am I the criminal? The cause of war? Amata, Queen of Latium, mother of Lavinia, wife to King Latinus, in a frenzied grip of sorrow, lost, alone and guilty, victim of cruelest gods, ties and noose, hangs it high and takes the life from her. The queen's daughter is the first to see. Lavinia howls from the fortress all the way to the god's own house in a grief that rocks the walls. And finally, finally, Jove, the king of mighty Olympus, of all the world, turns to his wife, fierce Juno. Where will it end, my queen? What is left at the last? Hmm? You have ignited an unspeakable war, degraded a royal house, and blessed the wedding hymn with the dirge of grief. But go no further. I forbid you now, my wife and queen. This I beg, Valatium. Never command the Latins to change their name. No Trojans here. Let Latium on her native soil endure. Let Roman stock grow strong, mixed with Italian blood. Troy has fallen. Fallen, let her stay. Come, my love, relax your anger. <gasps> I surrender to your wish. They'll speak the Latin tongue. The Trojan name will end. And you will see them outstrip all men. No nation will match the honors that will shower down. Juno nods in acceptance, and Jove sends a sign. Alecto, daughter of the night, Alecto speeds to earth, shrinks into a small bird. She flutters past Turnus's face over and over, screeching, drumming his shield with whirring wings, his hackles bristle in horror, his voice is choked in dread, and Aeneas sees his prey. Still in retreat, Turnus? Still, Still bent, bent on, on more delay? No more words. Glancing around, Turnus spots a huge rock, enormous, ages old, placed once as a boundary stone to settle border wars. A dozen men could barely shoulder it, but he wrenches it up, hands trembling, tries to heave it at Aeneas, but his knees buckle, blood like ice in his veins. Just as in dreams, when the mighty spell of sleep falls heavy on our eyes, and in the midst of one last burst of speed we sink, our tongue won't work, our body fails, so with Turnus, and as he hangs back, the fateful spear of Aeneas flies on with its weight of iron death. It pierces Turnus's breastplate, strikes home. The blow drops him to the ground. He lies at Aeneas's feet. I deserve it all. No mercy, please. If you care for a parent's grief, pity my own, and send me back alive. I stretch my hands to you, so the men of Latium can see my defeat. Lavinia is your bride. Aeneas shifted his gaze, stood there still and held his sword arm back. Then all at once, he caught sight of the fateful belt of Pallas, Evander's son and heir, whom Turnus had overpowered and snatched a trophy of war, unwarranted and gloated over from the noble young. And Aeneas, 
As soon as his eyes drank in that plunder, a keepsake of his own savage grief, he cries for Pallas. Decked in the spoils you stripped from one I loved? Escape my clutches? Never. I will make you pay the price with your own guilty blood. And in the same breath, Blazing with wrath, he plants his iron sword hilt deep in his enemy's heart. Turnus' limbs go limp in the chill of death, and with a groan, his life breath flees down, down to the shades below. Of wars and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate. He was the first to flee the coast of Troy. Yet many blows took on land and sea from the gods above, thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage, and many losses he bore in battle too, before he could found a city, bring his gods to Latium. Source of the Latin race, the Alban lords, and the high walls of Rome. In episode two, Aeneas was played by Richard Harrington, Anchises by Robert Pugh, the Sibyl by Fiona Shaw, Achates by Matthew Gravel. Turnus by Ben Crow, Amata by Airy Thomas, Jove by Michael Burtonshaw, Juno by Rachel Atkins, Venus by Annette Badland, Lavinia by Aisha Antoine, and Pallas by Arthur Hughes. The storyteller was Daniel Morden. The music was composed by Will Gregory, arranged by Ian Gardiner. And performed by the BBC Singers, conducted by Matthew Hamilton, with soloist Cherith Milburn Fryer. Percussion was by Joby Burgess. Virgil's Aeneid was adapted by Hattie Naylor from the translation by Robert Fagels, and was a BBC Cymru Wales production, produced and directed by Kate McCall. <laughs> Oh.